A warm good morning to you and welcome to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. My name is Keaton Shaw. This morning we have an exciting discussion, two parts with one guest. Uh, but uh, before I introduce our guest this morning, who's with us in studio, uh, let me uh, introduce my co-host colleague, my good friend, Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keaton. And this is also, again, another day. As much as it's a beautiful day today, I, I must admit, but it's somewhat marred because just once again, we kind of have the blame game going on. And whereas I am sure the supporters would love to hear the fire and rhetoric of their party blaming the other party, I am, it's just, it makes me wary to kind of go through another round of, well, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Especially in this case where in some of, some of the situations that they're bringing up, an argument could be made that it is very obviously still involving the party that's trying to pass the buck on to the other side. So it is what it is. We'll probably get into that uh, today at some point if we have the time. No, we will have the time. That's one topic that we focus on. The other topic that I hope to focus on is the continuation of the uh, where we concluded our discussion yesterday in relation to whether or not we would see an Indo-Trinidadian leader uh, at the helm of the People's National Movement Party anytime, or an Afro-Trinidadian leader at the helm of the United National Congress anytime. Um, with us now in studio, uh, alongside uh, Mr. Sean Michael Small and myself, is our guest this morning, the former mayor of Port of Spain. He's becoming a regular on this program, Mr. Louis Lee Singh. Good morning, Mr. Lee Singh. Good morning to you, Sean, and good morning to you, Keaton. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back. It's always good to be here. It's always good to have you here. So let's start off um, with that discussion first in relation to OAS. Now, it emerged during the uh, media budget review that uh, the government, uh, according to a tribunal in the United Kingdom, uh, owed, uh, out of the ruling of the tribunal, Brazilian firm OAS Constructura roughly $852 million. In fact, when all things are added up at the end, they can walk away with close to $1 billion. Now, over the last two weeks, it has been very silent. Uh, nobody has uh, commented further, but last night, the Prime Minister decided to focus on it uh, during a meeting in Arima, in which he indicated, um, well, he launched a scathing attack against the opposition. Let's just put it that way. And he's indicated that it's the United National Congress's fault uh, because three days before the 2015 general election, an addendum was added uh, to the contract in which it stated uh, overall that NIDCO was, ro was being robbed, essentially. This is what the Prime Minister is stating. He said this is what the addendum was state, uh, stated three days before it was added to the contract. And the result of it is now NIDCO is being robbed and the country is losing close to $1 billion. Um, the, and I quote now from the Prime Minister from last night, the contract documents had clauses in it that protected the country against bankruptcy. There was one clause, 152E, which said if the contractor is insolvent or goes bankrupt, the bonds the contractor put up go to the state. But the United National Congress did something to allow the contractor to go away with the money, end quote. Now, a couple of issues I'm pointing out here. The Prime Minister gave us information on what clause 152E states or stated. He did not tell us exactly what the addendum stated. He said it was added three days before. He didn't tell us exactly what it stated, therefore allowing uh, OAS Constructura to walk away with the money. Then he's also stating that the uh, PNM, when they won the elections on the September 7th, 2015 elections, that they went to court to, in a bid to get the addendum declared null and void. We never heard anything about that before. So this is the first time we're hearing about it. And this is generally my problem. I'm not arguing against the prime minister. He has every right and reason in his capacity to try and explain the situation. And in a sense, he's supposed to highlight exactly where it went wrong. But is he really highlighting where it went wrong or is he just passing off the blame again as he usually does? Well, I think the point is he is indicating that the UNC is involved. Now the question is, do you believe him? Ultimately speaking, it is a claim with a little bit more 
meat on the bones. Usually now we have to wait to see if the UNC has a counterclaim. And usually these sorts of claims that, that the Prime Minister makes don't get countered with anything substantial. And by anything substantial, I mean at the bare minimum, a different version of events to try to explain the situation. Usually what happens is, um, at best you will just say lies, 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 but nothing alternative put forward. But I think more often than not, you just, you just say nothing. It's almost as though then the debate just gets settled and the opposition just retreats back quietly into the night. So it'll be interesting to see how this turns out because that's not necessarily going to be the case here again. It's just that I, I find it interesting that based on the timeline, one does now have to ask, okay, well, what did Rowley do or not do that he should have done? What did, he, what did the UNC do or not do that they should have done or they should not have done, right? And then try to figure out who is to blame. And, and this is not the only situation of, of recent news where I have that issue with, you know, they're just trying to pass the buck uh, one against the other. Things like this, uh, the, the real issue with, 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 with the Prime Minister making a statement now is, why didn't you say this when you came into power seven years ago? No. So that we're not all just surprised by the revelation at a convenient moment. No, you see, the thing is, and I'm, I'm coming to Mr. Lisi now, um, I believe that the Prime Minister is playing upon the ignorance of Trimbegonians. Because we here in Trinidad, in terms of our political support, if we hear the political leader of the party that we support chastising the other party in the sense, not necessarily giving us details or not being reasonable in their explanation, we tend to just go along with it. So that may be the case. In this particular instance, I'm, again, I'm not arguing that the Prime Minister has every right to stand up to any wrongdoing but in this instance, again, it seems as though he's distracting away from the fact that this judgment was placed. Also, I agree with Sean, the timeline seems to be very odd. So it's a matter of how he's gone about doing it. Is this, in your opinion, Mr. Leasing, something that we should be getting accustomed to? Or do you believe the Prime Minister in that it's the UNC's fault? but he didn't exactly explain what the UNC did. You know, Keaton, I am getting almost, I feel as though I'm a, someone has placed weights on my feet and dropped me into the sea. That is how I feel whenever I look at the news and listen to the political directorates on both sides of the house. I would hope, if I focus on the parliament for a second, that the Speaker of the House would find the capacity to stop being partisan to one side and to ensure that there's equity in the administration of the parliament in terms of allowing people to do things and say things. And she would probably find less, as it were, aggressiveness in the house, particularly coming from the yellow side. <clears throat> I say that to you that I feel sinking because I know that I can't do anything to assist or to sort out what is going on. That rests solely with the people who are at the wicket at this time, who are batting and bowling and both doing a very bad job at it. We need to recognize, particularly under the democratic system, that when you come to office, you are probably going to find a lot of things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. You'll find a lot of things that are right. And it is your responsibility to enhance the right things and to correct the wrong things. Correcting the wrong things will require corrective action being taken in a systematic and organized way. And if it means ultimately the people who may have done wrong 
are sitting across the aisles from you, I don't think the parliament is the place where you come and you try the case. I think you have to, in an organized and aggressive way, ferret out the wrongdoing and bring these people to court. The Prime Minister, even though there is this thing about the separation of powers, if I were the Prime Minister, I would find the capacity to speak to the Chief Justice and say to him, regardless of what you think about the justice being separated and apart, you see these matters concerning A, B, C, D, and E, it is imperative for the well-being of the Republic that these matters be heard expeditiously concluded. That is not to say you set aside other matters. But these matters, A, B, C, D, and E, must be concluded by year end. That would be my first year. Mm -hmm. So that the Dana Sita Hall matter would have been ended. The Marlene McDonald matter would have been ended. The Jack Warner matters would have been ended. The Ishwa Galbaran Singh matters and Steve Ferguson matters would have been ended. When the population begins to recognize that the state, i.e. the republic, is taking action and swift and corrective action, people will begin to behave differently in this society. When, it, when, when, you, get a, when you challenge a policeman for wrongdoing, the complaints authority must have the real power to take corrective action. However it works out, we have to fix the rules and the regulations to ensure that the police complaints authority allows people to be heard, but corrective action taken on matters concerning internal police matters. We, you know, I remember years ago hearing about the finding cocaine in a, in a ceiling in a police sta station yes, yes. in the east. Mm -hmm. Whatever became of that? And we always talking about Mr. Big. Is it that there was a Mr. Big running that, that particular police station? I want to say to you all, we heard there was a time, there was a huge set of cocaine in, in, some, in, some, in, some, in some raid, they found all this cocaine. And when the cocaine was supposed to come to court, they, they told it, it looked like rats ate the cocaine. Our challenges in this country are not new. And what is interesting is that there are people in the parliament, particularly those who sit at the helm of government and at the helm of the opposition, who have seen it all, lived through it all. And today, we are still in the same place. The question must therefore be asked, are these people competent and capable to advance the, the well-being of our republic? Are they? And then you look at those who now offer themselves, all the, new, all the new, new kids on the block. What are their track records in terms of honesty, integrity, nobleness, decency? Where, where are the, all of these adjectives are used to describe what you should find in a member of parliament? Well, the insincerity of the people who offer themselves. You know, every time I get these, I get these, I get two clips a day, sometimes four times a day from Gary Griffith. He sends it on the phone, and I guess it, it, it is because I foolishly called, um, what was ever the number, something Gary, I called it. And so he now has this database with my number, and he sends me all these, these posts, many of them, all of them, I might say, the majority of them, has only to do with his defense of his own position as the former commissioner of police. He's the former, stop referring to him as the former commissioner of police. He is now, he is now, he is now a political leader of a political party. And therefore, let us treat him accordingly. All right, Mr. Lee Singh, you indirectly answered my question um, in the beginning of your rhetoric. And I understand where you're coming from. I want to actually pause on this conversation. I want to uh, wrap up this conversation. I want to take a quick break because there's another topic I want to dive into. Um, but, but just to let you know, yeah, Sean, I'm going to come back to you right now, actually. But in this entire instance, again, 
Many sides look at it. The side from the point of view of the Prime Minister and what he stated last night, giving very little information, but again, t attacking the opposition. Now, he's also done the correct thing in stating that he is calling on the Commission of Police to uh, launch a criminal investigation into this, as well as he's uh, informed the Minister of Works and Transport and NIDCO to also have an investigation done. That's the correct thing. The question is whether or not we'll actually get anything out of that investigation at all. And furthermore, it is now on the part of the opposition to clarify whether or not three days before the election or any time before the election, whether or not an addendum was added to the contract and what was stated. It is now up to the opposition to actually clarify these allegations. Don't just come out and say, we refute it and this man is talking stupidness and whatnot like you usually do. Be clear with us. Sean? Well, so now lies the twist to the situation, and I think we have to put a microscope on NITCO. Not only do we have what the THA is complaining about with NITCO's modus operandi over there, but apparently this whole thing... Who heads up NITCO? Currently, I'm, I'm not actually sure right now. But this whole thing apparently started because NITCO decided to terminate the contract and we lost in arbitration. Mm -hmm. And when you read about it, what the Prime Minister is saying doesn't seem to have anything necessarily to do with the fact that NITCO decided to terminate the contract and the arbitration panel decided that NITCO was wrong to terminate the contract. Then, of course, local contractors took over construction of the highway project. And now we see the, some of the results in Mosquito Creek and that has a whole um, investigation into that has to the collapse. By the, so, way, by the way, Mr. Leeson, to answer your question, Hubert George is the chairman of NITCO. So I, he's, a, he's a good Tobago boy. Well, I, 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 but NITCO, to me, now there are questions here with regards to how they're operating. And with regards to, was the contract pulled from the Brazilian firm? Because, uh, stop me if this sounds familiar, Keaton. The Brazilian firm had financial difficulties because NITCO wasn't giving them payments as per the contract. That sounds familiar. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of a government institution not paying off, not giving payments to, 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 to so, contracts, but, but, and then the companies relying on those payments but, but, becoming insolvent. But may I inquire something? You guys speak to this issue. Do you all recall the numbers at that time? What was the full extent of that contract? And if we know what was the full extent of the contract... I think it was $5.3 How much was it paid in advance? Well, not just how much was paid in advance, but also the fact that the panel is not finished. We might still owe beyond the 800 million. Yes, we, we actually... 870 it, something million. We might owe it more. over 1 billion. They could determine, they're still determining if interest is owed, as well as the fact that when they could try to take back the bonds, if an incorrect amount was was with regards to that transaction, so, and, they, so, and NITCO owes OAS even more money than that, based on the panel's judgment. So, you know NITCO would never have acted without the, the blessing of the cabinet? Probably. <clears throat> this is as, not as, a, as much as I don't, it's not like I have a camera to know for sure, but I believe what you just said is, is the most it, it likely. It is hardly likely yes. that this NITCO, is, yes. sitting this in a boardroom, I don't care how close Mr. George might be to the Prime Minister, um, I still think Mr. George is a very professional man. I, I know him. I still think Mr. George is a very professional man. But he has certainly found himself in some very deep waters. This isn't like swimming off Star Bay, you know. Mm -hmm. This is like swimming in the Galleon's Passage. You know where the Galleon's Passage is? You see, we have to, we have, you all have to get uh -uh. your geography together uh -uh. if you want to no, be, but, be leaders in this republic. But this is why I said that there are many parts of this story, and I agree with the Prime Minister stating, if his allegations are true, that... Let us police, restate his allegations. That the, yes. Let the, us restate the, his allegations as you interpret. I will restate the allegations <coughs> to you directly from his quote. Yes. And I quote, the contract documents had clauses in it that protected the country against bankruptcy. There was one clause, 152E, which said if the contractor is insolvent or goes bankrupt, the bonds the contractor put up to go to the state. But they, meaning the United National Congress, sorry, Sean? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. But they, the United National Congress, did something to allow the contractor to go away with the money, end quote.
So, but here, herein lies the problem with the Prime Minister's claims. In arbitration, Nidco's claim was that OAS was insolvent. And OAS claims was that the only reason why that happened was because Nidco was not giving them their due payments as per the contract. And the arbitrators ruled with OAS and against Nidco. So now I do have to question the Prime Minister's claims because he is making claims on the matter but based on a chain of events that, that, that the arbitrators don't so, agree with. So, gentlemen, just for the viewers, particularly those who don't follow all of these issues in, in other media sources, what is the amount of money we now have to pay this foreign contractor? The exact amount, as quoted by the Prime Minister, is 852, 969, yes. 825 million dollars. It can go up it can go beyond. Up. One so, billion dollars. So it is. That is in TT dollars. Yes. So we now have to find. Mm -hmm. About how many? What is that in US do, US dollars? That's just <coughs> about. It's one twenty six US yeah. right now. If it doesn't go up. So it's about one hundred twenty six million. One point three. One hundred. One hundred twenty six. One hundred twenty six million. 126 Sorry, million. I'm thinking billion in my mind. No. Yeah, I'm thinking 126 million US dollars. You know how many things I can do with that money for this country? You know how many faces we could put smiles on in this country? But we must, whatever projects we undertake, we must not put them in the hands of people who will siphon out the money. Well, therein lies the question. Because at the end of the day, you still have to ask, what did the opposition do or not do? But also, what did the current government do or not do? But this is and so, you see, you know, the average man would be saying, well, listen, let us do a proper inquiry on this. Ha! But hold on. But my own position is I don't want no more inquiries in this country. Nothing ever comes out of wait, my Wait, wait, wait. Paria is still in the preliminary stages. That's what we said. My, Nothing my, ever comes out my of own, inquiry. My own feeling is this that one day someone will come along in this country, they will declare martial law, and they will say, I want all the, the commission of inquiry reports brought before us. What were the recommendations? And the recommendations were A, B, C, D, and E. All right, we are implementing those recommendations as of today. What were the other recommendations? Who were responsible? Let's bring them forward. And then you say, all right, we want these people tried. And hopefully we would have nice cells for them by that time, and the matters would be held expeditiously. We would not have to be bringing, using any um, amalgamated vehicles to transport them. We would, put an, we would put the courthouses just opposite the maximum security prison. We'll dig a tunnel on, uh, underneath the road, so we bring the prisoners in shackles across, underneath the road in a tunnel into the court, and the court is sitting 24 hours a day. Let us bring all these matters to a conclusion so that the Republic can begin to exhale and breathe again. What is going on in this country cannot continue forever. I, I, as much as that is a very idealistic hope, I, I think what is more likely is, as long as we're on this path, I guarantee you the country will collapse and we won't even know how it collapsed at the end of it as we're going. And Sean, Gentlemen, and Sean think... this is why I, I'm preferring that one day someone will come along who understands that, listen, it is not important if I am back in office in five years. Ah. What is important is that during the time I am in office, I do as much as I can to fix Trinidad and Tobago. Now, there's one individual who did state exactly what Mr. Lee Singh just stated, and that was the Minister of Public Utilities, Marvin Gonzalez. He indicated that I may not be re-elected. I may have this may be my only time in office. He's indicated that his wanting of, re, of to restructure and the Prime Minister's wanting to restructure TSTT, uh, TNTech, uh, and all state utilities would have been political suicide. But is he actually staying true to what he mentioned at the beginning in terms of actually genuinely going after restructuring the companies? That's another question. But, well, but, but I, hold on. But hold I, on. I want to say to you. I want you to we, pause on we, that thought. We, we should have him in one morning and, and invite me to join you. I will. But 
I would like to ask him some questions this myself. This particular topic, again, there's so many aspects of it. I love the conversation, but at the end of the day, gentlemen, the allegations lie. However, we have no details, we have no information, we just have the Prime Minister again making allegations against the opposition. It is now time for the opposition to respond, and it's now time for us to see whether or not I, anything will come out of any investigation. I, I hate to say this, but the daily papers do a better job of responding than the opposition. <laughs> well, see, well, well, which is basically, see, which is basically what You should see some of the responses from, well, from the people. Hold on, these. hold on, gentlemen. If we want a comprehensive response from the Prime Minister's office, we've got to read Ria Tate. Yeah. That's it. Whenever Ria Tate comes there and they express, you know, I, I can't believe in this day and age, they still do this. They're still, they're still doing that kind of job on us. You can't have that. Because oftentimes those, those articles suggest largely a, a perspective that is coming out of the cabinet. So my, 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 I, see, I see Gary Griffith saying that, and it's perhaps one of the accurate things he has said. And it is something that you must note. Th there's nothing wrong with getting the perspective of the cabinet. What makes it wrong is if it's being passed off as an independent perspective. Well, hold on. I don't mind if you put, the, if you put verbatim what, what is related to you out of the cabinet. I don't mind that. Mm -hmm. But get a counter position. Please get a counter position in the same article, in the same article. Now, pause on that discussion. We will continue it. Um, we just have about five minutes before we take our break. And Mr. Leasing, I have to ask you, I'm sorry if I'm breaking the conversation, but this is very important to me. Yesterday, I posed a question when we had Camille Pascal on about whether on any time soon in Trinidad and Tobago, Right. I think we've turned a blind eye to the fact that racial prejudice exists, and it is a problem. It is a challenge here in Trinidad and Tobago. There is no unity, or very little unity now. But the opposition leader announced the internal elections of the United National Congress, and she is going up for political leader once more. I think that's a mistake, but that's just my opinion. Do you think, I posed this question yesterday, do you think whether or not we will see an Afro-Trinidadian leader of the United National Congress anytime soon, or an Indo-Trinidadian leader of the People's National Movement very soon. And somebody called on the program yesterday from Port of Spain, sounded very much like you, similar to you, and indicated that perhaps not now, maybe in 30 years plus, we may quicker see an Indo-Trinidadian leader of the PLM. Do you agree with that? I do. I'll tell you why. If we know the history of Trinidad and Tobago, and we understand how the parties have evolved and developed, we would better appreciate why we are where we are. When the PNM started off on its journey that was intended to be a life-saving journey, a, a, a developmental journey, a journey where morality in public affairs was a fundamental, which is to say, Issues associated with Foster Cummings would not have arisen, and so on and so forth. Issues associated with Marley MacDonald would not have arisen, and so on and so, on and so forth. And on the other side, issues concerning, what's the guy with the sports life on name? Oh, uh, oh Anna Roberts. Uh, Anna Roberts. Roberts would not have arisen. Don't forget Anand Ram Logan, the Attorney General, would not have happened, and so on and so forth. That was morality in public affairs. But it was not restricted to that. Remember the issues of the fat boy minister, uh, sorry, not the fat, I do, I retract that. The former MP for Porters, for Digger Martin Central, who was the minister of sport and youth affairs. Daryl Smith. And, and the issues with the, with the young woman and things like that. Mm -hmm. That would not have arisen. Morality in public affairs. All right? You wouldn't hear all these rumors about the prime minister jumping up in a van and things, you know, with young people. And it, it's a totally different thing. What I'm saying to you is this, that the PNM sought to build a political institution that had some measure of purity. But along the way, the man who is credited to be the father of the nation, Dr. Eric Williams, who, in my view, did a reasonably good job. Was he the best prime minister? I would say no. Because he erred fundamentally in that he took a position that he wasn't dealing with 
the wrongdoing of his closest ally in the party, a fellow called John O'Halloran. And John O'Halloran will continue to haunt this country and haunt the politics of the PNM until the PNM is no more. Dr. Williams, had he investigated, charged, tried, prosecuted, and whatever is the outcome, whether guilty or innocent, if he was found guilty, incarcerated two names, a fellow called O'Halloran and a fellow called Privat, mm -hmm. there would be no culture of corruption in this country today. He failed to do that. And so the culture of corruption grew from administration to administration to administration to the point these days where people on the other side talk about a, a carry box being filled with um, 100 blue notes is a million dollars. How do they know, how do they know that? They, they perhaps receive some carry boxes. That's all I can say. But I, I'm saying to you this. Along the life of the PNM, they sought to be multiracial. And there was a strong influence of Indian people within the party, whether it was Errol Mahabi, a very, very good man, politician, a good person. Kamaladin Muhammad, very strong man, very influential, very effective person. And so in the PNM, you had that happening. But in the UNC or the UNC predecessor parties, whether it was the BLP or ULF or whatever, you did not get that sense of urgency to, as it will, ensure a mix of people at the helm. It is now happening. You have Julian John. You can't get a more African person than Julian John. And she's a deputy political leader in the UNC. As to whether Julian John is a, a real powerhouse in the UNC is left to be seen as the years go by. So she, the, the UNC has started the process. And when you look at UNC meetings and rallies, you're seeing uh, an increased number of Africans in the audiences and what have you. But as to whether the, the UNC is going to allow Africans to really emerge within its ranks, that is perhaps the biggest challenge that confronts that party. Under Mr. Pandey, however, he gave a genuine attempt where Mr. Pandey had people like Carlos John and, 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 and a whole range of other people mm -hmm. in strategic and key positions. Now, I'm saying this to say to you that I feel it is easier for a fellow who is not an African to emerge in the PNM for those very reasons. In the context of the UNC, it would be far dif more difficult for a uh, in for a non-Indo Trinidadian to emerge within the UNC. And that, I, I rest, that's my premise. Interesting enough, I agree with Mr. Lee saying that uh, I would quicker see an Indo Trinidadian leading the People's National Movement than an Afro Trinidadian leading the United National Congress. Um, and for you, the caller, I'd like your opinion when we open up the phone lines or, or, or after you, 9 o'clock. Or, or you could say a non a non African in the PNM because it could, you could get a Chinese, a Syrian, you know. Yes. And in the in, and on, on the other side, a non-Indo Trinidadian, you you would hardly see that happening. Very good way of putting it, Mr. Lee Singh. Folks, let's take a quick break here on the program and return. Well, we take a, a lighter look at things and uh, we focus on art and culture. Mm. Stay tuned. Jazz 2022. Sound the horns! After Family Saturday, the sky ignites with Blue Sunday. Where Juve meets Spam meets Soka. Juve meets Spam meets Soka. Look how the sun now raising up, and the crowd now waking up. The atmosphere have vibes, and nothing can break it up. A Juve experience featuring Hadco's Phase 2 Pan Groove. Mixed master DJs and powerful Soka. Witness the expression of a newfound freedom with paint and vibes. Vibes, 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 vibes. Dance along to the music of our national instrument. Blue 
Sunday, a colorful experience, a tradition you won't want to miss. Sunday, May 29th, Festival Grounds, Blanche Shows. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival 2022 comes alive. Three days, three events, three experiences. Born here, played here. Sound the horn! Get your tickets now at Crosby St. James, Extra Foods Arima, Sagri Grandi, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor and Chaguanas, Digicel Trin City, C3 Mall, and Digicel Head Office, 11C Marval Road, WESN 30A Gattaca Street, Woodbrook, Suntix.com, or call our ticket hotline at 628-5835 or 681-1516. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival is brought to you with the kind support of the Inter-American Development Bank, Digicel, Angostura, Amco, Hadco, Blue Waters, Royal Castle, Gittins and Gittins Real Estate Agents, and WESN. Burning questions, urgent topics. Welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fix It, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. If you live with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 and has to self-isolate at home, take care of them from a distance and reduce their movement around the house. Give them space, a designated space, and open those windows. If you have to be in contact, mask up, both of you. If you work, stay home from work and don't go out not even to the grocery or pharmacy. And remember, no visitors allowed. Limit the contact to limit the spread. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Often we speak about unity, community development, and we tend to focus a lot on art and culture, more so in relation to heritage in Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the things that uh, is championing that cause in its fourth edition this year is the North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival. Now it's starting from this Friday and uh, one of the organizers of the event, one of the founders of the event is, interesting enough, Mr. Louis Leasing. Mr. Lee Singh, it's very exciting reading about what is uh, going to take place on Saturday. But I must say, the theme this year, family, a tribute to Lord Nelson, is very exciting. And at the same time, you know, before I get too carried away, I must admit that taking it from that perspective also allows a younger generation to get a taste of Lord Nelson, who, who may not necessarily know or would have heard of Lord Nelson before. Well... All credit to John Gill uh, in terms of the selection of working with the, the concept of family and in recognizing and uh, honoring Lord Nelson, he, well, his real name is Robert Nelson, mm -hmm. at the 22 festival. Now, each year, for example, in the, in the, in the first year, we did that for Kitchener. And we went on, and then the last year before the COVID was out of the blue, is in recognition of shadow and the, and the music. And we have a tendency to go towards the people who are more musically driven in their, in, their, in their creations. And Nelson is perhaps one of our better sons in terms of the music that goes with his, his lyrics. So John felt, coming out of the COVID, it would be an ideal time to drive home the concept of the family. You know, we're back together again. We're working together. 
we're doing what we can to build Trinidad and Tobago together, and so on and so forth. And that is how the, the, the theme for this year, this year's Jazz Festival came alive. In more ways than one, I, I, I mean, when, we, when we, we broke earlier on in breaking, you were saying, uh, we're going to take a, a, a lighter look at Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to say to you, the North Coast Jazz is not a lighter look at all. <laughs> North Coast Jazz is serious business. Not only from the, the point of view of the workload involved and the fact that we are seeking to do a major event in a remote community way out on the North Coast called Blanche Shares. In fact, you know, the, the, the North Coast, the Pario Main Road stops in Blanche Shares because it can't go any further. So that tells you it sounds far. But Blanche Shares is really an hour and 15 minutes from the Moncoco Road in Maraval, you know, where the police station mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And that is with my driving. And if you drive with me at all, my, um, Darren and my, my, my kids, my children say, suggest that I drive like if I'm a, a hearse driver. A hearse driver? I drive slowly. You know, a few. Okay, okay, a okay, few, okay, okay. All right? That's so morbid. Oh, gosh. No, but the, of the, all things. No, no. They, 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 they're ascribing how I, the speed at which I drive. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. I drive. So you get there in an hour and 15 minutes. So it's not far. Think about how long it takes you to go to San Fernando and you have the open highway. Um, so that Blanche shares for us and the North Coast Jazz is a serious business. In that, the, and I said it to Andy earlier on, but I will repeat it because you may have a totally different audience, Andy. The purpose of this thing is to assist in the development of a destination. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people know of a destination. They hear about it, but sometimes nothing could lure them to it. Mm. So we wanted to do something that would encourage people to come to Blanchishes, but not only come to Blanchishes for the jazz festival, but will always come back because of the feel-good experience that the village and the community exudes. Which is interesting because it, it goes to your catcheries born here and, and played here in relation to the Blanchishes community. Well, more than that, that's the Blanchishes community, but the born here, played here is really talking about our music. I said to Andy earlier in the week, as we sit here this morning, there are hundreds if not thousands of Trinidad and Tobago musicians of all categories, of all, skill, of all skills levels, getting up now and rehearsing or writing a song or working out at, at the tail or at the guitar or the piano and what have you. And these people really have limited platforms to display their work. We've got to find a way where our artists become our go-to concerts. And so we have created a platform where we select the best based on what we know, as what we are aware of and, and our own observations happening in the music in industry. And we give them a platform once a year at Blanche Shares. The formula has worked well in that I think artists feel honored to be invited to play. And we, in turn, are in a position to offer our audience, our patrons, some of the very best that Trinidad and Tobago has to offer. And so the concept of born here, played here, as insular as it may sound, we do not encourage artists on our stage from outside Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll tell you why. Growing up, I grew up on a menu of foreign music, by and large. And so when I became conscious of Calypso, um, Calypso was always associated with rum drinking. Um, in, my, in my village, in Malik, we were the fellas, the youngsters, who might have drunk rum. And we listened to Calypso, but we also listened to uh, rhythm and blues. We also listened to, you know, the full gamut, the Beatles, whatever. But we loved Calypso. And so the fellows who listened to dance hall were the fellows who smoked marijuana. Mm -hmm. 
You, you follow? Mm -hmm. That just happened to be how it was. But I, in particular, could not, as it were, not like Calypso, because I grew up on a street where Relator and Calypsonian Bali lived two houses away each. I lived two houses away from Bali, and Bali lived two houses away from Relator. So our street was a street of Calypso. North Coast Jazz, therefore, is a platform where Trinidadian and Tobagonian artists, will, you will see them. You will see them in all their magic and all their glory because we are not likely to put a stranger on our stage. If you have Trinidad and Tobago roots, you are going to be on the stage. Oh, we have to put you on to sing sometime then. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I mean, so looking at the lineup, it's not as though it's limited to Calypso. What it's limited to is to try to encourage and to showcase local talent, which I found was quite impressive because, relatively speaking, it's not as though this, this, this event has a 20-year heritage that, that people are going just because it's ingrained and institutionalized. It was something that is fairly recent that you all launched 2017 and has more or less been successful more or less from the beginning. And to see the response to the local artists here, some of these uh, people I actually know. So I, I, I'm very much happy to see them being part of something so successful locally because the entertainment industry and our arts and culture doesn't always get those things that are not necessarily involved with suka or fetting, don't always get the due that, that, that they deserve. And some of these guys, um, this, is, this is their lives. This is their, this is their first from school. This was not something that they just kind of do on the side. This was something That's that they- That's the point I make. They are, every morning they're rehearsing and preparing mm -hmm. for the show. But that show perhaps may never come in a year. So that we want at least once a year, at minimum, to open up the Blanchichere stage it's a very costly exercise, very, very costly. But we do it because, in a sense, everyone benefits. The people who come enjoy a feel-good experience. The villagers of Blanche Shares, they work at the festival, whether it is sanitation, security, they set, put up their boots, you name it. It's, it's their story. There's, well, there's going to be a lot of um, vendors and, and, that's and exactly what I was food available. To, actually. And, yeah. So we have... A, we have the first pick vendors are, you must be of the North Coast. Oh, okay. And you must have, and, and, and the, ma the majority who come are from Blanche shares. So that you get, if you want to perhaps come and taste the best pelau, the best stew something, stew chicken, stew pork, uh, stewed fish, whatever, fried fish, it comes from Blanche shares. In addition to that, you get an array of, sweet stuff, mm -hmm. you know, good sweet stuff. And then you get craft from Blanche. She has people who do, on the North Coast, who do craft of one kind or another. So it is, it is, we are not only treating with the music components of our heritage, but we are also treating with craft and cuisine, which is very much part of our heritage. Uh, my family used to go to Blanche shares every summer. And you know, the ones from abroad, we were, it would be a big thing. Rent two houses that were next to each other. And um, they haven't done that in a while. But one of the things that I did enjoy was there would be the local ice cream man with his homemade coconut ice cream that we would get at least once each trip. As well as, I, I'm trying to remember what else you would, we would get locally because we would, we would stick to ourselves, but there would always be like somebody passing by with something, something to buy, and it was never disappointing. Yeah, best fresh fish. That's a good. A go, that's that's a good endorsement of what, of what we what I. It been, was never uh, disappointing. Oh, well, folks, listen. Uh, the North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival kicks off uh, this Friday. Three days, three events, three experiences, uh, with uh, the twenty seventh featuring the twenty fifteen film Bazzardi, starring Marshall Monson. That begins at seven p.m. And, whilst and, Chris, and hold your thoughts, and we do have a surprise for the opening of that. 
the opening. Don't give away the surprise. No, I, I want to break the surprise because people who are in the community for the for the for the night, they should come. They should miss it. Mavis John is doing a courtesy performance for us. Okay. And she's going to be doing one of my favorite songs. I've asked her to do it. And that is, that will precede Basoli, the, the display of Basoli. So people who are, who are in the community or people who want to drive up, don't come early, come for 7 o'clock. Because if you don't come for 7, you will miss perhaps one of the finest contributions that could come from that dear lady, Mavis Sean. Well, Mrs. Leasing, thank you very much. Now, look forward to that on Friday night. Now, on Saturday, starting at 3 p.m., family, a tribute to Lord Nelson, the Jazz Festival kicks off. And then from 2 a.m. on Sunday, uh, you will experience uh, the Juve, and we look forward to that as well. Uh, Mr. Leasing, uh, I hope that Sean and I should be there, actually. Yes. Given the, uh, Sean, you're driving. Um, and oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not driving anymore. I'm not driving anymore. I, 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 well, anyway, let's not go into that. But we look forward to it. So, folks, that's the thing. Surprise, surprise. Talking Point will be there as I well. I mean, you know, WSN will be up there. We will we, we cover the event. Have a, have a little cookout. Mr. Lee Singh, you can come and, and, and taste some of, the, some of what we have, if you have the time. Because, because you, have, you have already said that, well, it'll be a busy weekend for yeah, you. Yeah, three days, it is, it three is. experiences. Folks... We look forward to the North Coast Jazz Festival. If you need your tickets, look out for them for this month. But you can call us here at WSN and we'll certainly be glad to organize them for you. Anyway, folks, uh, we're going to break for news on the hour now. And when we're in, we open up the phone lines this morning. Stay tuned. North Coast Jazz 2022. After Family Saturday, the sky ignites with Blue Sunday. Where Juve meets Pan meets Soka. Juve meets Pan meets Soka. A Juve experience featuring Hatco's Phase 2 Pan Groove, Mixmaster DJs, and powerful Soka. Witness the expression of a new fanned freedom with paint and vibes. Dance along to the music of our national instrument. Blue Sunday. Blue Sunday. A colorful experience. A tradition you won't want to miss. Sunday, May 29th, Festival Grounds, Blanchichelles. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival 2022. Three days, three events, three experiences. Born here, played here. Tickets available at Crosby, St. James, Extra Foods Arima, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor, and Chaguanas, Extra Foods, Sagri Grandi, Digicel, Trin City, and Gulf City Malls, WESN, 38 Gattaca Street, Woodbrook, Suntex.com, or call our ticket hotline at 628-5835 or 681-1516. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, 
multi-camera productions, live events, streaming, and virtual conferencing. We are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sport? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is it's no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing on it. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it now pressure on Nicholas Paul? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go all day and rep the red, white, and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door on. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. I The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The, the communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I tables accept. are turned, when the tables are turned, okay. it's the same it's the same way. Okay, this has been 10 questions. I'm Andy Johnson and we we'll see you next time. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to one on one. The show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens. Where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think, act and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11am, only on WESN, Content Capital. I am Rondell Donoa, attorney at law and host of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Strictly Legal is a legal program geared towards informing you, the public, of your legal rights, responsibilities, and remedies. So be viewing Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. North Coast Jazz 2022. Day two, event two. The big day is Family Saturday. And the biggest stars are performing on festival grounds. Michelle Sylvester, Ruel Lynch, Patrick Gordon, Adam Hagley featuring Tony Paul, Leandra Head, Johan Chuckery, Sharon Phillips, Freetown Collective, powered by festival band Dean Williams and Company. Each master talent will perform a song from Lord Nelson's wide catalogue. Saturday, Family, May 28th. Together again, Festival Grounds, Blanche Shows. Family, a tribute to Lord Nelson. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival 2022. Three days, three events, three experiences. Born here, played here. Tickets available at Crosby St. James, Extra Food Tarima, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor and Chaguanas, Extra Food Sagri Grandi, Digicel, Trin City and Gulf City Malls, WESN, 38 Gattaca Street, Woodbrook, Suntex.com or call our ticket hotline at 628-5835 or 681-1516. Welcome back to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. Keaton Shaw alongside Mr. Sean Michael Small. 
and Mr. Louis Lee Singh. So let me just ask you a question before we open up the phone lines. We are no longer referring to Gary Griffith as former commissioner of police. <laughs> we're, we're referring to him as a political leader. Yeah. So do we I had the stop same thought. referring to him as a former mayor of Portis Bay? <laughs> Hear me. With me? Uh -huh. Aren't you a political leader? With me, you just say mayor. Okay. <laughs> uh, aren't you former, former political leader or oh, political oh, oh, leader? Hold on. Wherever I go in this city, they refer to me as mayor. Uh, mayor or Lord Mayor? Mayor. That's okay. all. That's good. Just, enough, just mayor. I was just wondering. And, was and, 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 that, <laughs> and, that, and that is only because people remember I was a mayor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, listen, the phone lines are open now. 623-9376, 622-9338. Call in and join us on Talking Point. I think there is a, perhaps, I don't know if, if they will call in this morning. There's a particular caller who might disagree with you in your statement that Eric Williams was not the best prime minister. Well, that, that is the right... Well, when you say best prime minister, of TNT or in general? Of Trinidad no, well, and Who else? So, yeah. so who was the best prime minister of TNT? Based on my rating and based on, on internationally acceptable standards of the expectations of a prime minister, Patrick Manning was the best prime minister. Hmm. Followed by... Followed by, sorry, followed by George Chambers. Very short term. Right. But a difficult period. Followed by A.N.R. Robinson. Followed by Eric Williams. And that's where prime ministers ended in this country. What is, in, funny enough, I, I don't even need to talk to you about uh, Kamala Pasabi Sassan and, and Keith Christopher Rowley. I, but what about Bastio Pane? Where does he lie on your list? He would fall in after okay. those others. All right. Well, we have a caller on the line with us from Santa Cruz. A good morning, caller. Welcome to the program. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, hey morning. Good morning. How are you guys? We're doing well. How are you? We're, we're all the more better for hearing your voice. <laughs> and I'm back in Santa Cruz. Welcome back. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, my lady. How are you? I am blessed and highly favored. Thank that, you for asking. That I sense. Gentlemen, so I have to agree with Mr. Lee Singh's um, suggestion because that is what I've been calling for and acknowledging for the longest while about calling to task this O'Halloran Privat thing that happened to us many years ago that has created our, the mandate to frustrate. And mm -hmm. I'll leave it like that. Yes. I'm also quite excited about, you know, the festival this weekend. I expect to be there on Saturday. I'm looking for some place to stay so I can be there on Sunday. So I'm remembering that you guys are going to be there, so I'm going to be looking for you. We, okay? would, we cannot wait to see you. We will be there. <laughs> All right. In have fact, you know what? Day. Come and talk to us. Uh, we, we, we'll have a surprise for you. Come and talk to us. I will definitely come and talk to you. All right. Thank you. Have a, yeah, have a good you one, Kola. You too. Have a great one. Thank you, Kola. Uh, you know, Mr. Lee Singh, that is a call I'm always, always very happy to hear from. But she I has... thought you would be happy to hear from all your callers. But of course. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm looking forward to one particular caller. And I think... <laughs> I... <laughs> we have a caller on the line, ladies and gentlemen, from Shogonas. Now let us see who it is. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Ah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good, morning, good morning. You will live long. As usual, you misquote me. <laughs> As regards Dr. Eric Williams, I said he was the best prime minister in his first two terms. And I gave the reasons for that. He brought free education. He put the water and electricity out for Trinidad and Tobago. He got back a base from the Americans when plenty of people was getting there. The problem with Williams is two things happened. We got independence, and then certain unscrupulous people like Johnny O'Halloran and them took advantage of a psychiatric condition that overtook Williams. And when Carl Hunter Phillips, 
try to conquer them because he was trying to manipulate the public service. Dr. Williams, under the delusions of grandeur, as the condition is called, sided with them. After that, his administration plummeted. Right? At that end, he obviously was the worst. Right. Any questions on that? I've told you that before. Listen, mm, yes, yes, yes. you told us this before, but I always remember this, Professor. I always remember this. You quoted more than once in this program that, in your opinion, the best Prime Minister Trent Bay was ever had was Eric Williams. And you didn't say specifically that is two not teams. True. You go back and look at your I, I will, I will, show what the I will go true. back and look. I can't remember. Gentlemen, anyway, thank you, gentlemen, Colin. Thank you. Even, even if that may have happened, Clearly, this morning is a, 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 cor yeah. a corrective position, uh -huh. which I welcome. <laughs> we have a caller on the line with us from St. James. Good morning, caller. Please, please put down the volume on your television, caller. You're live. Hello, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Um, I would like to endorse what Louis Lee Singh mentioned a while ago about, you know, the, the um, how the, the, this sort of problem we getting into now started with under Eric Williams and his cohort. Now one key name he forgot to mention, I don't know if you clip him, was a guy called Owai, the horseman. Bury Owai, he's the man who went to Panama. Well all of them went to Panama. <laughs> you know, um I, I, I endorse what he said. You know, it started from, from Eric Williams and you know it sort of flourished under him. Mm -hmm. It's coming right up now to to where we are at now. So, okay, have a good Thank day. Thank you very much, Cola. Have Thank a good you, day. Thank you, Cola. By any chance, are you going to be playing David Rodgers? I go into Panama on, <laughs> on Saturday. You never know. <laughs> we have a call on no, the maybe line. maybe on Sunday. We have a call on the line with us uh, from Diego Martin. Good morning, Cola. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. I good just morning. want to take issue with one statement made by the caller from Shagona. Go on. Um, he mentioned that Dr. Williams won over the base at Shagaramas. I would just like to say that in the early 60s, within the first five years, because of the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles and the Polaris submarines and all of that, mm -hmm. the United States was getting, it got 66 bases off its hands all around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, strategically, the base here no longer was as necessary. Whereas before, during World War II and, and, and so on, and, and there were concerns with, with, with German naval vessels traversing the Atlantic. I think one, one ship was actually chased by the Allies all the way down and then to had, um, South America. You had also, at the same time, um, the embargo on Cuba part of the Cuban Missile Crisis with all yeah, but, but, concerns. But by that point, like... But do you remember the big stick policy? Yeah, but strategically, the, the, the little base in Trinidad, if there was a more of a, or a bigger communist presence, and they had a base in Panama, or they have a base in mm -hmm. Panama, if there was a bigger communist presence in South America, maybe it would have been harder to get that, that, that part of the country back. But I guess because we were democracy, there were democracies all around us, it, it, it wasn't as necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, call us in on the program, 623-9376-622-9338. Man, it seems as though quite a few people, oh, calling him man now. Yes, yes. Uh, quite a few people are in agreement with your perspective on Eric Williams and Johnny O'Halloran. Well, it is difficult not to be, to know the facts and not be objective about it. Think about it. If at that early stage, day one, as happened in Singapore with Lee Kuan Yew, I, I think I have shared with you all the, the, the story already, mm -hmm. where in, on, in Singapore in the early days, at, at one of the key ministers in the cabinet went on vacation and had his vacation expenses taken up by some business entity, some corporation. Well, by the time he got back from his vacation, the Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, had the security forces wait, waiting. They arrested him. They tried him. 
convicted him, and they imprisoned him for wrongdoing. And that had to do with the fact that Lee Kuan Yew had set up the, the rules of engagement where he said that our cabinet members will be paid the, the corporate rate. In other words, whatever is the highest rate being paid in Singapore, that is what cabinet ministers will get. But if we catch you putting your hand in the till, which in this case, this fellow was putting his hand in the till, he had to pay the penalty. I had no objections to that in Trinidad. But in Trinidad, we continue to pay peanuts. And that's why we get the monkeys we have. You follow? Mm -hmm. let, I, uh, let, let no one fool you about it, you know. I do wonder. When, when you go back to Sports Life Fund and all of that, and you go back to, 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 to the community development and where the community center was stolen and all of that, that's because these people are small-time tees. You, you, you follow? In big-time so, positions. I was just yes. about to say, big-time positions, small-time thieves, but big-time crooks. No, but, right, but also I do wonder if we see a similar thing go on, going on with teachers, doctors, police officers in government employ, where if the financial remuneration is limited, at best you will get limited performance you know, or limited applicants. Sure, at worst, you'll get corruption. that particular example, uh, you mentioned doctors, and I've heard this multiple times, that within public health institutions, you have doctors, uh, I mean, make the argument you want about the conditions of public health institutions, but you have doctors always referring to their patients to go to this private institution. Mm -hmm. no, but keep that private hold, institution. Keep hold on. At best, we have a terrible public health system which allows the louses. You know what's a louse? A louse is get onto your earnings, mm -hmm. right? Who are medical practitioners, particularly coming into the system to feed not only on the public health system, but to, the, to use the public health resources to develop their own private practices. Well, we're going to develop further on that point. Uh, we have another caller in line with us from Diego Martin. Good morning, caller. Hi, guys, and Mr. Lee Singh. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning would you mind if I digress a bit, please? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so this morning, as the younger teacher in my home left for school, he wondered what he would say to his eight, nine, and ten-year-olds when they ask about the shooting. In Texas, yeah. Because they're very aware and they have real-world conversations in art class. So once more in the land of the free, we're seeing an 18-year-old who could not buy a bear, get a tattoo, but he could buy assault weapons. Everyone will send thoughts, prayers, hold vigils, admit that the U.S. is the worst in the world for mass shootings, They'll all cry and say we're better than this, but, you know, clearly not. Greg Abbott is more interested in protecting lives of the unborn than the living kids. These kids were preparing for graduation because tomorrow is their last day. It turns out it's the last of their little lives. On Friday, the same Republican senators will go to the NRA convention. There will be more open carry laws instead of background checks. I'm going now, Keaton. But lastly, if the U.S. didn't do anything after Sandy Hook in 2012 for 20 babies, when there were 15 school shootings, then 30, then 50, to 100 to 240 last year, it's May, and there's been only 18. You know, no political will. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's go. We have a call online with us from Diego Martin. I have to tell you something after. Good morning, caller. Good morning, morning. sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, uh, I just want to comment on, on the OS, the case that the government has lost. Sure. Yes. It's high time that these officials, and whoever they may be in high position that are responsible for these things, are held accountable mm -hmm. and be made to be paid out of their salaries every month that pay back these things. This country is bleeding. If you check on um, this present government that how many cases are lost because of negligence and stupidity. It ha cannot continue on taxpayers are paying this and then they want to know where all the money going. Something has to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. People cannot be just getting up one morning and here they lost a case of close to a billion dollars and the taxpayer has to pay for it. People are struggling in the country to eat food, to earn a living, to 
be their families and you have to take up a lump sum of money and pay it out. That is not governance. That is cruel to the people. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for taking my call and good morning. Thank, Thank you very you much, caller. And I, it's things like this that makes the government, I get the wage negotiation and wage increases are difficult. But then when you come now and potentially waste a billion dollars, it's hard to justify, well, we can't afford to pay anymore. Yeah, you yeah because you're wasting a billion dollars. Wonder, uh, whether or not we need to, just like we have a heritage and civilization fund, if we need to set, set up a separate fund for, to pay off all these state cases that we are, we're losing so much of. Well, they, 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 it, comes to, it comes back to this point. I, this is where I started the discussion this morning with you. People who are elected to office are not appointed. They are elected and understand the process by which they are elected. Many of them go knocking on doors and they convince people to vote for but, them. But, but Louis, in this country, we vote by party, not by candidate. Hold on. So, that, so that you could argue that the only person we really voted for is the Prime Minister. No, no. And he appoints all the MPs. No, 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 no. That is not how it is at all. Don't believe Penny Beckles didn't walk her, her foot souls out to convince the people in the Arima constituency to vote for her. That is a, a marginal seat in, in more ways than one. She has worked and convinced people. So it is now her responsibility to convince her cabinet colleagues that they must do right by all manner of men, including the people in Arima, to help them get things done. But you could only do that if you are noble, sincere, honest, decent person. Visualize Marlene McDonald, conversely, and I will continue to use Marlene McDonald because Marlene, and, and, and maybe this says something about Kamala Prasad Bisesa, as she defends Marlene McDonald. Because she, Kamala Prasad Bisesa, must know about the wrongdoings of Marlene McDonald, how she manipulated the system to do what she did. Let me finish. It is the responsibility of the incumbent government, the government that comes in, to fix everything in, in its office. Whatever is wrong, let's fix it. But equally, it is their responsibility to continue to develop and build on the things that they would have met there. Let me ask you a question. Oh, yes. Contract. And, and, and the completion of this highway, the question is, was it a well-conceived, well-thought-out decision? I'm asking the question I don't know. I'm not in the cabinet. I'm not there. I was never there. So the question is, the government has a responsibility to really tell us and put, put, print the facts in the papers. Make the officers of the cabinet who were involved, the NETCO people, available to us so that we could ask them questions in public forums. We must be able to ask Mr. George, Mr. George, on whose instructions did you suspend the contract? We need to know. We need to know. You, you follow? And the same goes for, for the, the wastewater project, where we spent another billion dollars. All right. You remember the wastewater project that Kamala and they were building? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. But Mr. Lee Singh, we, we need to know. Very little time that we have left. Very, very quickly, because I just have to mention one thing to show me. Very quickly, 30 seconds, in your opinion, with the arguments you, that you were making about Penelope Beckles and Marley McDonald and so on and so forth, and Sean's point about arguably they vote for the prime minister, they vote for party. If Marlene McDonald somehow in 2020, sorry, not 2020, 2020 in 2025, were to go up for the People's National Movement uh, for Portia Spain East, would she win her seat? It's possible she could, but it is also very possible she won't. The tide has turned in this country. And unless the People's National Movement can find, as it were, the character, the qualities that people are now yearning for, people want very simple things in this country. They want to be able to know that when they wake up in the morning, nobody has kicked down their door. They want to know that when they leave home, and they walk to the corner to get to work, they are all right. 
I'll take 30 seconds. They want to know that when their daughters leave their homes or their sons, they are unmolested or, un, or not bullied. They want to know that when they go to work, nobody harasses them sexually or otherwise. Conversely, they want to know that they could travel back home without too much hassle. They want to know when they open their door, it is locked and they could open the door themselves. They want to know when they go in and they turn on the lights, there's light in the house so that the two pieces of chicken they have in the deep freezer is not spoiled. They want to know when they open the pipe to shower, there is water in the pipe. Right, well, Mr. Simple Lisa, things. Thank you very much. Now, I hear you. I agree with you, but I think that thought or that sense of thinking changes during an election. Sean, very quickly, in relation to the um, school shooting in Texas, Majority Taylor Green just won her GOP nomination, and she tweeted in relation to this, we do not need any more gun control. We just need to be closer to God. <laughs> so, while I don't necessarily disagree with those two things, I think part of the problem with, in America is gun control has become so political, it's almost like the political aspect of COVID. I, I reach a point where I don't really want to hear from either side about it. Um, because I guess it, it now comes back down to how they formulate these laws. And what should be familiar to us is all the nitty gritty and the details and the loopholes or just the, the, the lack of understanding on technical levels. And we have those problems here and we need to be better about that here. But as to what Mr. Lee Singh was saying, we get some small time fellas and they come into parliament and they become big time crooks because they're not really looking at big pictures. They're looking at their small little how do I get ahead? And, and Sean, and may I add to that? I can't and let that, we, we And precisely time. because they have no leadership in the cabinet, that is where they end up in the trouble. Well, folks, that's where we have to wrap up our program. Don't even have time to close. All else I'll use, I wish you all the very best. Hopefully, we'll see you again tomorrow morning. And remember, today is a good day to have a good day. I'm Keaton Shaw. This has been Talking Point. Bye-bye. Be a brass, keep up. <laughs>